Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for coming. Welcome to this parallel session. We have a great panel here. I really appreciate you all being here. And first of all, I would like to thank the organization for giving us the opportunity to be here and share with you our vision and our thoughts of current smart city situation. I am Jaime Medina from Ametic. Ametic is an association with more than 300 ITC companies. And one of our biggest initiatives was the, the launch of the Smart Cities Commission like two years ago. Now this commission is composed by 140 companies um, with concerns and initiatives in the smart city sector. As we don't have too much time to go deep in the different issues, I would uh, just like to point out a couple of relevant data before giving the floor to our reputed speakers. First of all, the European Parliament in his report, Mapping Cities in the European Union, point that the countries with the largest number of smart cities are United Kingdom, Italy, and Spain. Curiously, we have here speakers from each of the countries. In the case of Spain, this fact shows that they would, they would work that public authorities is doing in this, in this area. And obviously, this huge event is just an example of it. Let me also share with you which is our view from the Commission about the smart cities, the smart cities tendency. Our view is uh, the, right now the current smart cities growth is just the result of the digital transformation that is happening in every corner of our society, of our industry. Obviously, our cities and communities are affected of this new perspective, and we should be smarter enough to guide this new change in an effective way. So the goal of the next hour is to make clear how collaboration between local governments, private companies, citizens, is vital to success in transforming our cities. OK, now it's time for the speakers. In this parallel session, I have the pleasure to present five distinguished panelists that are going to give you their personal experience implementing smart regions, strategies, and projects. Um, after the, after this, this session, we are going to have a, a small slot of question and answers, and the organization has implemented an ask and vote methodology. So if you want to send uh, questions uh, through your smartphone, just uh, download the application and click in the session, and you can send questions over there. And OK, I have the pleasure to present at the, in the first time uh, Mr. Daniel Marco, director of Smart Catalonia from the governor of Catalonia, Spain. Daniel. Let's check. It's, it's working the presentation. Thank you very much to all of you for being here. Thank you. Sorry. OK. Someone is, someone is waiting for me. Uh, my name is Daniel Marco. I am the director of Smart Catalonia, as Jaime said. Smart Catalonia is the smart country strategy of the government of Catalonia. Uh, welcome all of you to Catalonia. Catalonia is a, it's a country of um, seven and a half million people. It's in, in the middle of Austria and Denmark. Also similar GDP uh, than Denmark, a, a, a third less. And uh, we already have in, in, our, in our country region uh, more than 900 municipalities with different, with different sites. I will, I will try to explain why the government of Catalonia put in place this smart country strategy. First of all, because uh, we think and um, it's necessary to, to understand that the challenge of the city, it's, it's not possible to, to, to affront this, this challenge only in a, in a scope of the, the city. An example is the mobility. Mobility, I live in a city. I work in another city. In the weekends, I go 
to another city. I go to shop to different cities. And uh, all this uh, movement that I am doing can be solved as a, as a unique vision from the different parts. Also in other fields like tourism, health, social services, or so on. Uh, we have global challenges, but we need, we need to act locally. Then that is why uh, also we need to go border the, the cities. In, a, in the other hand, we already have Barcelona, Tokyo, San Francisco, big cities with big smart uh, city strategies. Also mid medium-sized cities are, are very innovative, but what happens with the rest of the cities that we have in our country? Sometimes they, they don't have the technical expertise or economical budget to front uh, such challenges that they, that they will have in the future. Then the supra-local authorities, like the, govern, the government in a national way, the, the provinces or, or others, can help them in this, in this context. Also for us, it's very, very, very important that to have this smart country strategy, it's a way to develop our economy. Not only for the digitalization of the traditional industries, Catalonia is a, a huge industrial uh, country, also to, be, to develop the, the new industries of the future. And uh, at, at the end, but not, not least, the government of Catalonia, we are a, a public administration, we are providing public services to our citizens. We have full competence in education, in health, in security, we manage uh, infrastructure, roads, highways, and so on. And the same that the cities are doing, that we are looking here in the Smart City Expo, the same vision of a holistic view to solve the challenge, a, a user centric and a citizen centric vision to, to develop the public services, the public private partnership with the technology. This is also very, very needed to understand and to in, include in the public service of the, of the government of Catalonia. For these different purposes, the, the government of Catalonia put in place two years ago that we call Smart Catalonia. Smart Catalonia is the smart country strategy. It's a citizen-centric strategy that we have initiatives in all these fields. With the citizen at the center, working with, with the cities to define uh, open models to them. Also, with a network of cities, working together with the cities to deploy a common vision and common services. The, the technology that is around these uh, cities are our services, deploying uh, different projects and initiatives to boost our technology and industry, and also different fields of action in the government, economy, on territory. I am going to explain some of our initiatives, uh, more in the, in, the, in the vision that how the government of Catalonia can help to cities and communities to develop together a common strategy. One is the project of the smart uh, country platform. The digital revolution of our cities, our country and our societies are based on platforms. Platforms are the way we are regarded information, where we connect people, we connect things, we connect companies, all together needs to be on a digital platform. And the way that we are working with the government of Catalonia is we are implementing ourselves these kind of platforms, but we need to help also the, the cities and the small cities uh, to define these interoperable platforms. An example is, I don't know if you know Centilo, it's a census platform that the Barcelona, the Barcelona City Council developed. Together with the Diputación de Barcelona, we define a model as a service platform of, of, of Centilo that gives access to the different cities. Now cities can access uh, as, a, as a platform, as a service, to a common platform that works together for them. Another initiative, another project, it's the Catalonia Smart Lab. Catalonia Smart Lab, it's a network of urban labs, network of cities, of companies, and of citizens that work together in an open, uh, open innovation environment. What is really important of this network 
we put in contact companies and cities to test pilots, to test new solutions, to innovate. But what, what, what is really important to that is that we create a network to exchange experiences. One uh, city is working in noise reduction in Moyerusa, a very, very small city in, 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 J in, the, in the area of Lleida. And the results of these projects can be shared with the, the rest of the network. We already have 35 cities, more than 100 companies working together, exchanging information and uh, best practices that is one of our main goals. Also, when we have a, a good result, a good best practice that has been done in San Cugat, we can try to extend this project to other cities. And this network is the way we, we are affronting, we are developing this kind of projects. Projects to exchange knowledge, to exchange services, or to deploy also a common vision that we already know. Another project is uh, T-Mobility. This is a project of smart mobility of, of the government of Catalonia with the city council, the, area met the metropolitan area. That uh, it's a smart cart that goes to mobile. You can use it in the different public transportation. It's, it's very smart because you have, if uh, you pay only by the use you are doing. This is more or less a typical uh, smart mobility project. But the difference that we have done in the definition of this project is that the scope of that. Now it's starting with the area metropolitan area of Barcelona, but in the in the in the next in the, in the next years we will do that in the whole uh, country. More than 70 public transportation companies we will work with the same platform. We will have a unique uh, app application or platform to access uh, for the citizen. We will have all the information together, of the, all the public transportation in one system. And this will provide uh, a new model of governance of this information to that. Now we are starting with all public transport that we will have in place in the next years. Also, this will be a, could be a platform to, to, to incorporate by seeing uh, projects, smart parking projects, and private uh, projects related to mobility. This is the way we think we need to deploy the projects. Thinking in the scope of the national, in a national way and try to implement it together with the governments, with the, with the cities. Another project, uh, very, very important for us, is M Schools project. This is related to the talent, is uh, to, put, to put closer the technology to our, our children. And we are developing with the Mobile World Capital uh, in the curriculum of the, of the schools, uh, a subject to develop applications and to define new smart, new smart solutions. Also, with extracurricular extra extra activities in the, in the primary area to, with coding and, and robotics. We have already now 20,000 students, 1,000 schools working together implementing this, this program around the, the country. And this is very, very, very important for us for the vocational uh, way to develop the next uh, smart technology hub. For us, we are, we, it's important to have the citizens in the middle, to work together with the, the, the cities, to develop common uh, platforms and common services in different fields. But also, we need to have our own industry. We don't want to be only consumers of these smart technologies. We want to be also producers of these technologies. And this is why we are developing different initiatives in the big data. We put in place a center of excellence of big data, IoT Catalan Alliance to develop the cluster in IoT, smart drones cluster for drone solutions, and so on. Also in this project, one of the most important things is the projection that we provide to the, the, the global economy. Uh, events like today we have here are inside this strategy. We already have in place the Mobile World Congress, 
the Smart City Expo World Congress, the IoT Solution World Congress two weeks ago related to uh, industry, 3D printing uh, World Congress in 3D industry, and we have during all year a platform to show which are our, our companies, our technologies, are also to define, to exchange knowledge together with all the different areas of, of actions. This is more or less a taste of what is Smart Catalonia. If you want to know a little bit more, we have a booth in the Congress just outside this, this door. Uh, there we have a lot of companies that are providing these solutions for us. Also, we have projects uh, and detail for, to, show, to show to you and different demos that they want to explain. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Daniel. Now it's the turn of intervention of Mr. Pierre Mayotte, Senior Technological Advisor of BOSS, located in San Francisco. So good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm uh, representing Bosch today uh, in North America. Um, you'll see uh, what we are doing there. Uh, before I start, I show you a little bit of information about my company. Most of you will know Bosch for uh, washing machine or power tools or maybe now translation device. Uh, but actually, we do much more than this. And I will start with a short uh, video. So the idea of this video is really to show you what we are doing. The, the company is moving towards a, a connected world, uh, relying strongly on Internet of Things, um, based on three technologies that we are actually um, developing. Sensors or things, uh, as you might not know, three smartphones out of four are equipped with Bosch sensors. Um, software, software technology, and uh, service and application. And when it comes to actually cities, uh, we have different areas uh, which are shown here where we are able to develop solution. I will not go into the details of this solution. We have a booth uh, at the conference where you can come and discuss a little bit further with us. The idea of today is really to show you how we are leveraging this technology in the development of a smart community in San Francisco. So we are working with a company called Five Point, with uh, the master, uh, master developer, uh, developer technology, sorry, company. Uh, and they are the largest on the West Coast in the US. We are working on a project located in, in San Francisco. And for the people who are not familiar with San Francisco, um, it's located in the south of San Francisco. So you see downtown San Francisco. And uh, we are working on these two communities, which are called San Francisco Shipyard, which was a former US Navy shipyard, which is now being completely redeveloped, as well as Candlestick Point, which was the former home of the 49ers American football team. So all these two um, communities are being currently completely redeveloped. And if you look at it, um, how it would look like in 15 years from now, it's going to be um, 12,000 homes in total, 5 million square feet of commercial building, 
and almost 1 million square feet of retail. So it's basically a small city almost, like within the city, uh, in total 750 acres. So it's larger than uh, the principality of Monaco. So we are working with this uh, master development company to make it more innovative and technology oriented. So the reason why we are working for them is basically they are considering these developments as something very unique, uh, considering the, the scale of the project, and they are looking at all the different market trends. So the connected world, obviously, the need to improve mobility, health, or people getting older, um, the need for new way of working, public spaces, and so on. And if you look at all these trends, they are very much the trends that we also see in smart cities. And um, in the way they wanted to develop this project, they were thinking, we need a strong technological partner to go along the way with us and to look at how technology will impact our development in two, five, ten years from now. And um, that's how the partnership with Bosch started. Uh, basically, what they liked with Bosch was the wide scope of activities and solutions that we are delivering uh, in building, in energy, security, mobility, and also um, our technological strategy, which is basically to say we can't, we can't do anything by ourselves. And to develop smart city solution or smart community projects, you need to rely on partners. And uh, based on this, partnership need, our solution are open. Um, we have an open platform where partners can actually come and develop solution together with us. And obviously, um, you need also to take into consideration what's going to be the impact of technology in five years from now. So mobility, as of today, everybody has a car, but now with autonomous driving, with new solution around parking, people will not necessarily own their own car. They will Instead of buying a car today, they will buy mobility. How this will, an, will have an impact on the future development of this community. So the solution that we are developing now, they, no, they need to take into consideration what's going to be the future. So they need to be scalable, evolutive, uh, so that we don't just get locked into one single solution which will be obsolete in five years from now. What is also unique in the way we are working with Five Point is really focusing on the partnership and how we are collaborating together. So I am a Bosch employee, but my office is actually located in the Five Point premises. So I am embedded in the organization, working with them, with the marketing team, with the operation team, development team, and looking at what are their challenges on a daily basis to make this big development happen. So. We look at this really from a holistic perspective, uh, look at how the challenges are, are, can be addressed with technology, and that's how we are actually uh, developing new solutions. So what we did so far, um, if you look at the picture on the left side, this gives you a rendering of the first residential development. As of today, there are 130 units which are occupied, so people are actually living there. Um, and we have been developing two solutions which are still under development, but some of them are actually active. There is um, a community app which, will, uh, which is delivered to the residents where they have information regarding uh, transportation, local businesses, or community information. And um, so for example, there is a shuttle service which is going from this community to downtown and they can get informed, they receive notification on when the shuttle is coming, when they need to, to, to pick it up. Uh, additional features and functionalities are being developed as I speak. Um, another solution which is currently being deployed is a video surveillance system. So we are using our Bosch intelligent camera, which we will install on the rooftop of the building and provide a kind of intelligent um, safety solution. It's a not a gated community. It's obviously very open. You saw on the first slide how many open space and public park they want to develop. So. Obviously, they want to give this feeling of very open and, and lively community, but we need, obviously, to take into consideration safety. And one of the challenges that we have in smart cities is to develop cross-domain solutions. So how these two solutions are uh, interconnected with each other. So as an example here, 
in, in a very soon future, um, the residents will be able to actually, with the neighborhood watch functionality, they will be able to actually capture something happening within the community, whether it's a picture or video, and this snapshot or this information will be actually sent to the video surveillance operation center, which will be then able to act on it. A big part of the development is also about commercial building and retail. Uh, we have solutions which can uh, be delivered for building and, and retail, uh, but also in a more general perspective, how this community is being developed. And one of the solutions that we are now currently exploring is our smart parking solution. So uh, relying on sensors on the ground, which are providing the information whether the vehicle is parked or not, this obviously provides very interesting information to the visitors who are coming to the retail mall, but obviously also provide a lot of information for the parking operators. And there is also this big question in smart city and in general with big data, is how we are leveraging this data, how we are making sure that this data can be used. So what we intend to do here is um, develop a parking data analytics functionality. So you can imagine that, for example, after six months of operation of this parking, based on how many people are visiting, whether it's a Monday, whether it's raining, whether it's a school day, I can actually almost forecast what's going to be my next day visiting um, operation. So I can improve the lighting of the parking garage, I can improve the staff, and I can actually improve my operational cost. So that's what we also intend to do, create solutions which are providing either additional revenue to uh, the community or to the developer in this case, or additional benefits to the, to the residents. And this is something which um, is, is important for us because having Five Point as a master developer, it's obviously also having the relationship with the residents, with the people who are living there. So we want to have them also at the center of the solution that we are developing. Our solution must be customer centric. We need to involve them, make sure that what we are developing brings benefits for them. And uh, when we look at it on a holistic approach, that's how we also intend uh, to develop our solution. So that's it for my side. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pierre. Uh, next at the presentation is Mr. Giuseppe Mantero, Managing Director of Linea Comune, Firenze, from Firenze, Italy. Good afternoon to everybody. And welcome to Florence. I believe most of you know Florence as a nice city, touristic city, full of art, the city of Renaissance, but is also a city where the people live. Uh, and so in Florence, we started a few years ago to develop some project that we start to, to develop and deliver a set of services for the, what we call the city users and for the city around Florence. So uh, about uh, 10 years ago has been created uh, Linea Comune, that is the company I manage, uh, that has the scope, uh, is a company owned by local authorities and the scope of the company is to help the uh, local authorities to deliver services to the uh, citizen and to the visitor. When, uh, when, you, when you look a bit at Florence, apart the, the art, apart the tourism, and you look as a city, this is a city, what in, in Italy we we'll, uh, say is a medium-sized city, is a bit less than uh, 400,000 inhabitants, uh, but has something like 9 million of visitors per year. So there is a huge number of people that come to the city to visit the city. It is creating a set of issues, a problem. And when you look at where it is in the area, is well, it's roughly in the heart of Italy, and live in an area where there is a lot of variety. Around, the sea, around Florence, there is a set of cities and towns that are let's say, normal industrial, and uh, with, uh, they are very famous uh, for uh, fashion, a big, a big name, big, big brand of fashion like Gucci, Ferragamo, and so on, uh, stay there. 
But when you look uh, a bit more around, it's in the middle of uh, uh, Florence, is in the bottom of the valley. Around there are tall mountains. Mm, they arrive uh, close to 2,000 meters. And a lot of, uh, of town and villages. Uh, and each of them has its problem. So a big challenge we had uh, when we started was uh, how to face, uh, how to deal uh, with this complexity. Now, after 10 years, we have some numbers, we have uh, some lessons that I would like to share with you. And we have still a lot of problems to, to deal with. Now, these uh, this figures are taken from my last uh, early report. So our number from uh, 2015 and uh, give an idea about uh, where we stay now. We have built a set of systems uh, that uh, help uh, citizens to get uh, the services that normally th they could have uh, from local authority without physically going uh, there. So th these are just uh, some numbers. I, I, I don't show you all the presentation. It will take one hour. But uh, just to say we are talking about, uh, as I said, a population is uh, a bit more than 600,000 people. We had the last year uh, more than 1.1 uh, million of uh, service requests. Where service requests may be uh, things like I, I need to enroll uh, a child to the school or I need to uh, open a shop. And all this has been managed, uh, let's say, without physically going to the, to the offices to get uh, the service of the city. The numbers are quite important if you look the, if you think of the impact on the community. And these are mostly related to citizens, but we have some number of, that are related to visitors. We manage a, a set of uh, programs to help the people uh, that visit Florence to get better uh, service from the city, including visiting museum, visiting art, itinerary, things like this. One thing that I found particularly interesting is that this slide show the usage of the system around the 24 hour. So it means that, uh, you know, there is a sentence in New York, never sleep. Florence is much smaller than New York, but if you look there, also Florence never sleep. At 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock in the morning, you have people that get services. And 40% of the service in, can, can be assessed, are assessed when the, the offices are actually closed. When I was showing uh, this, this slide in another conference, there was uh, a lady that uh, challenged me, said, well, what is strange if you look at the, the a slide from Amazon, it's like exactly the same. And it's true, because uh, people that use Amazon, that uh, is the same people, that uh, need to, uh, to get the service from, from the city. The, the, the strange is that, at least for Italy, is that uh, we are able to give the services when the people need it, and not when the, the office is open. So this is uh, one of the, the things that we believe is uh, particularly interesting for us. Now, coming to the, the specific of uh, this presentation, uh, the part of the challenging we have is about the variety of the um, of the territory, I mean, when I when I when I talk about Florence as a city, we have a set of issues, and uh, if if I took Florence, the main issue is how to deal with this huge number of uh, visitors that come in the city, uh, without uh, penalize too much the living of the citizen. If you take the area around uh, Florence, uh, uh, the big issue, as in most cities of the world is mobility. So the people need to know how to get uh, there, when to get there, how to find parking, uh, things like this. And when uh, I move uh, more ahead, I go to the mountains, uh, I, I face uh, uh, a set of challenges that are quite uh, different, uh, uh, quite uh, interesting in some way. Because we face situation where we have uh, a lot of uh, uh, physical constraints, for example, connectivity. We have uh, uh, also demographic constraints. Uh, we have, uh, uh, at least in Italy, but I believe it's true in, at least in Europe, in, in most, uh, most cities, we, we are a situation where when, when you look at the town outside of the big cities, there is an age, a population that is aging. 
the young people tend to move closer to the city to where the work is. And uh, we, have, uh, some, we have one town to where the average age is uh, 67. And you can imagine how uh, can mean bring services there. Uh, but we need to bring services. We want to bring services uh, also because we need to help these people and we need to help these communities uh, to exist, to continue to exist. They need to have the possibility to work. They need to, to, to without to be forced to live. Otherwise, we will have a situation where the small town around uh, that they will die. And uh, another issue that we face uh, and is uh, uh, more related to the capability of the local uh, uh, authorities. Uh, normally, the smaller local authorities have uh, smaller capabilities to deliver. They don't have enough people, they don't have enough competencies. So we need to, to find a way to help them to, to deliver the services to everybody. But in some way, the kind of services we deliver are different. It is as an impact also in the kind of structure, in the kind of strategy, in the deliver of service that we need to have. In this moment, what we are doing, it has proven to be quite uh, successful, is we, we have, a, let's say, a twofold approach. We have a, a standard, what we call, I call an, an heavy infrastructure that is common for, uh, let's say, what I call the large city that is not so large, but Florence for me is a large city. And the small town where we, I deliver what are infrastructure, infrastructural services. Typically in this kind of services, a structure like uh, the identity, the payments services, that are, uh, be, there is not a lot of personalization and need to be common to everybody. Then uh, I need, uh, when I regard uh, to the different communities, uh, to have the capabilities to tailor more the services and to adapt uh, at the use uh, of, of the need. Uh, as I said, a good example is uh, when I look to the urban area, there is a lot of attention, a lot of work on uh, um, things concerning the mobility, the information about the traffic, the problem of the traffic. When I go to the smaller uh, cities, uh, especially on the mountain, they need a lot of more support to help people to, to, to do the things without moving and to get information about what the lo local community is doing. Uh, when I look, at, now we are, we are working a lot uh, with uh, developing uh, uh, apps uh, that is quite popular everywhere. But uh, if I think to Florence, uh, in Florence uh, we have uh, several uh, tens of, of maybe hundreds of app all related to the city. When I, I move to a smaller town, uh, we tend to focus and to, because there is no market there for apps, so we tend to focus with one app that give all the kind of information the citizen there live. Uh, and we conjugate information about the local event, the information about the services, the information about the um, meteor, the accident, uh, the road, the status of the road, the things like this. That help the people to live there to get the right, uh, the right information. Just a, a small e example and ad an anecdote is this is not an ECG. <laughs> is a, a, this is a, um, Google Analytics, uh, and we keep track of the assets of the system. It, it, the, the three names, uh, Bagno Aripoli, Borgo San Lorenzo, and Pontasieve, are three small towns around Florence. Uh, two of them are on top of the mountain. And there you need the number of, us, you, you see the number of assets per week. And as you see, normally they are very low. There are two peaks, it's, it's quite old, this slide, and something that gave us some information about what to do. Uh, there are two peaks that are uh, uh, one day in 2010, and one day in a couple of months later, in 2011, we had a peak that was uh, almost 20-fold, 20, 20 times the normal number of assessors. What's happened in those days was that we had uh, a navy snow. Uh, one was uh, a Sunday, one was the um, Wednesday, and all the people was looking at the network to understand what is, was happening, if the road was open, if the school was open, uh, and so on. 
this was I used it as uh, the, 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 the increase is impressive. As I said, is uh, 20, 30 times what is the normal number of access to the to the network of the of the city, and uh, we use it as uh, to, to to make also aware the major the, the the local authorities on the fact that today the people when want information look at the net. So they started from this, this as I said, is quite, quite old to develop. Uh, initially was uh, some web application, and now they are up that help the people to, to be keep informed about what is happening. Because the people want to have this and use the technological information, also in small towns, also in towns that are remote on the mountains, to understand what it will happen. And it's a channel that is very, very important. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Giuseppe. We continue with the presentation of Mr. Alberto Donaire Avila, System Analyst and Project Manager of Consorcio Fernández de los Ríos from Granada, Spain. Hello, thank you. I come from Granada, Andalucía. Um, thank you for letting me explain you uh, the Guadalinfo strategy for smart cities. Uh, Guadalinfo project was born in, in 2003. Um, from then, uh, since then, we are developing uh, activities to fight uh, against the digital gap uh, in almost all in rural areas and population and towns with less than 2,000 uh, inhabitants. Now we have uh, more, more or less uh, 800 telecenters um, distributed uh, throughout all the territory of Andalusia with uh, uh, technologi technological resources and um, people working in them, developing activities with people um, and is managed by the uh, Consorcio Fernando de los Rio, um, uh, with uh, Andalusian government, Junta Andalucía, and the uh, Council uh, government, the La Provincia de Andalucía. Um, this is the Andalusian territory with uh, more than 87,000 uh, uh, kilometers and uh, square kilometers and 90 of this uh, territory is rural. And 20% of this territory have a uh, natural protection. With uh, more than 8 million of people, 50% uh, is, uh, live in uh, rural areas. So the well, info centers have a, a, a active uh, role in the developing of uh, a strategy of uh, against a new uh, digital gap with the uh, developing the smart policies only in, in big cities. We help to develop the, the activities of the project or strategic project of the government, like the uh, Junta Andalucía, Andalucía Smart, and we have a network to, to work in, in against these uh, these uh, problems, the strategy our strategy has uh, uh, three main ways or three uh, keys uh, axes. Uh, the first is um, we have in the in the Guadalinfo telecenters the the capacity to 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 gather the the people and help to uh, participate uh, in the develop and the design of the local strategy of a smart, uh, municipal smart. We help people to uh, train in the um, technological tools that we, we have to develop in this strategy. And we also uh, are a guarantee to access to all the people to these tools with um, disabilities and less economical resources. 
we have um, a, a big network to work against this, um, this problem, and we have a big uh, capacity to, um, to work together in, the, in, in all this territory and have uh, great capacity to uh, diffusion and coordination and assist uh, to the municipalities and governments to uh, contact with people. And last, the um, Guadalinfo Smart Lab. In a region of uh, Andalusia, we are going to, to develop a, um, a, um, a project with, uh, with people. And they uh, are going to, to, to participate in, a, in, the, in the working and developing the, the projects and the technological uh, entrepreneur. This is um, a very important thing for, for the next four years in, in Guadalinfo. So I, I let you so three questions for my, my ending to reflect all people here. One is, can we maintain the uh, population in rural areas with smart policies? The second is, are we developing the smart policies with the people uh, participation? And the third is, how are we going or how are you going to uh, train the people with these new technological tools that are we uh, developing for this uh, strategic um, in a smart cities. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alberto. To end the round of presentations, we are pleased to present Mr. Graham Kolkow. Kolklauch of Urban DNA from London, United Kingdom. Thank you, Haim. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I I'm the solution for uh, three problems I've heard. Um, I, I hope there's other problems out there that I can also be the solution for. And the solution, just so that you know the answer before I start, the solution is called the European Innovation Partnership for Smart Cities and communities. Now, I'm also a Scotsman, and um, I'm going to tell you a story which is very relevant. There's an island on the west coast of Scotland which is 60 kilometers off the coastline, and it's the size of four kilometers by three kilometers. It has one beach and a lot of cliffs. In the year 800, it had 180 people living on it, and that number remained between 180 up to 200 and down to 90 from the year 800 BC to 1930. In 1930, they took the last 30 people off the island. What happens, they were called natives, and they walked and they climbed the cliffs without shoes on. The point I'm making is that what happened in 1930 is industrialization moved people from that island onto the mainland. By the way, there's another island which has 26,000 people on it, which is the Western Isles. It had 29,000 people on it five years ago. And they're all five years older, and there's quite a few of them less on the island now. What's happening is people are moving to cities. People are moving to the mainland. That's stark reality in Scotland. However, what you've heard is three stories of a gap which is forming between the big and the small. And we need to solve that because it's really important. So here's a data point. 54% of people in Europe don't live in big cities. Yet our focus has been for the last 10 years on the ballerinas. They dance beautifully. They're the big cities, the Amsterdams, the Londons, the, ba the, the Barcelonas, the ones that are doing great things and innovating. And that's good, by the way. That's very good. But we are creating a gap between the large ones and the small ones. Let me give you another metaphor. I was down in Africa, and I was looking at termite mounds, and I thought, that's really interesting. 
What goes on inside the termite mines? I wish I could stick my head in there. Now, these days, you can stick cameras in there. They have air conditioning systems. They have waste systems. They have transport systems. They have all the systems that we have in cities. And I thought, that's really interesting. And I'm a city advisor. But what happens between the termite mines? What does it feel like for those people that are in the rural hinterland? You know, we can't neglect that. So the problem that we face currently is a broken smart cities market. And the broken smart cities market, think of four pieces to that market. We have come from 10 years of technology-led, industry-driven market, and we need to move fundamentally to a completely different market, which is city needs-led and demand-driven. So that's the journey that we're on right now, which means that demand, i.e. cities, need to take control. Now, you've heard the issue of capacity as being something which is a profound challenge. And it is. But it's not the only one, by the way. So I think of four pieces to the market, which is currently broken. You have, on the industry side, a lot of industries that are going like Bosch. We wait make washing machines and various other things. And what you've heard is how Bosch are actually getting smart and joining up with master developers so that we can integrate from the built world to the technology world and take the physical and the digital and join it together to give better solutions for the people. So we're seeing on the industry side a shift in terms of building ecosystems. And you heard it from the man who said, we can't deliver all the solutions ourselves. We need to understand how to partner. So that's the challenge on the industry side. The challenge on the demand side with cities is for cities to figure out how they can collaborate. Because every city wants to be the best city. Every city is unique. By the way, you are all unique. But by the way, we're all the same as well. Even males and females, 90 something percent similar. So what are the solutions that we can deliver on the demand side for cities that are systemically the same? So collaboration is the big agenda on the demand side. And there's a problem which we're creating which is even bigger for the small and medium-sized places, which isn't just about capacity in a skill sense, it's about money. So investors don't invest in cities. They don't invest in small cities because they're risky and they have no financial counterparty. So organizations that can create that scale can become investable. But how do you get the cities to collaborate, particularly when they're all little mayors in Italy or Spain or France or any other place? And we're doing all of these three things, by the way, for society. And cities don't understand society. Not yet. They try hard, but they don't. So that's the problem that we have, and it is profound. Now, the choice that you make is whether you join the solution or not. So let me tell you about the solution. The solution is the European Innovation Partnership for Smart Cities. Who's heard about it? Hands up. There are very few people. That's good. So now you're going to hear about it. The Commission stole money from the countries and gave it to the regions for at least 20 years. And then after they were doing this filtering process, which was a bureauc bureaucratic process in Brussels, they then thought, hmm, maybe we need some large-scale pilots. So they put some large projects in place that they could point to. But the problem is when the money runs out from Brussels, because there's lots of bounty hunters to Brussels, when the money runs out, the project stops. So they've created the European Innovation Partnership. The idea is to bring those four components together to collaborate. And that's beginning to happen. There are five partnerships. One is on smart cities. All of the other four, by the way, cover off topics like water and energy and such like, which are very relevant for cities. And everybody can join in. There's no charge fee to join in. And what we're seeing is a collaborative marketplace beginning to actually happen. So most importantly is that we don't just bring in big industry and big cities that have got solutions, but we actually bring in where 50% of people plus live, which is the small and medium cities, into that marketplace. Now, I have no idea where you guys come from, but you probably come from one of those four things, a city, an administration in a city, industry, or an investor. And if there are investors in the room, there's real fundable opportunities beginning to emerge. And I'll end in one very simple thing. Three years ago, in a basement 
in, in, in a hotel in Brussels in a dark room, a bit like this, at the end of a Friday afternoon of discussing at the beginning of the journey of let's form the European Innovation Partnership for Smart Cities. I said to 60 people, there must be something we can walk out from today and feel proud about that we've come up with a really good idea because I haven't heard it yet. So what is it that we could do very practically today which would make a difference? And there was silence in the room. And I said, well, let me give you an idea. The humble lamppost. A lamppost delivers light. But by the way, you can deliver at least a dozen other things which are additional services which are valuable on that lamppost. So that would be smart. So why don't we create in European cities a million smart lampposts? And the first reaction was, that's a really stupid idea. Um, the second reaction, Barcelona and a couple other cities say, we're doing that, actually. And then suddenly the industry said, oh, I didn't realize that. Maybe I should join in this journey as well. After two weeks, we said, a million is too small because there are 90 million smart lampposts in Europe. So we created 10 million as the target. And there was something really interesting that happened. Number one, the commissioners got interested. Number two, investors got interested. Now, how do you create scale? Demand aggregation. Demand aggregation of where more than 50% of people live is in small and medium cities. That is our opportunity. So as organizations, whatever you are, our opportunity is to try and actually create a functional market as opposed to a current dysfunctional market. And I would advertise for you that the European Commission's driven EIP is a worthwhile place to start that journey. Thank you. Thank you very much, Graham. Very interesting presentation. Well, uh, right now is the slot for question and answers. So, first of all, I would like to give you the word. So, if anyone in the audience wants to raise his hand and, and, and ask anything, please feel free. Okay. Okay, I, I am going to take this opportunity to... I was thinking and, and I know which is the relationship between in Spain between public administration and private companies when you start a smart city project. And was, when Pierre was talking, I was thinking about how is this in the United, uh, in the United States? So my question would be, um, how is the participation of San Francisco in your project? Is, is the city active? Uh, uh, are they supporting you? Thank you, Pierre. Yes. So um, basically, the, the master developer is um, in close relationship with the city. So there is a, an agreement with the city on how this community should be developed. It includes uh, need for affordable housing, needs for technology, needs for decontamination of the soil. So the city is definitely involved in the, in the process. And uh, in parallel to that, uh, the U.S. have uh, launched a smart city challenge, mostly focusing on, on transportation. But uh, there is a big also smart city uh, initiative in the U.S. So as a Bosch representative working on this community, I'm also in um, direct contact with the city of San Francisco. And they see a huge opportunity to uh, leverage the project that we have there as a greenfield to test some of the solution that they are um, investigating. OK, great. Thank you, Pierre. Yes, we have a question over there. Uh, my question. Hello, hello, good. So, a question for Graham. The, you, you said cities don't understand society. I was wondering if you could expand on, on what you meant by that quote, that cities don't understand society. Hopefully this now works. Um, I'm somewhat provocative in some of the statements I make, one of which is uh, cities don't understand society. Um, I, I've had a few mayors upset about that. 
Um, it's not a personal attack to the mayors. They are trying very hard. It's not a personal attack to administration. But what I'm saying is that cities currently are, what is a city? Cities are not one organization in terms of those that need to understand society. They tend to be a variety of different departments. So if you actually map, I don't know whether you come from a city, but if any of you do, if you map the different interventions that the v different departments in a city make, in terms of understanding society. So one end of the spectrum, once every four years you do a census. It tells you how many people are there. That's important because that's the money you get from government as a result of that. At the other end of the spectrum, you take little flash images in terms of social research, which costs a lot of money from big organizations that do very good research. But a lot of that data is snapshot. Um, and then there's some political ones as well. So that, that signal which is the demand signal, which is utterly vital. If you go to any design, you need to understand demand. And that demand signal comes from all sorts of different places. And cities don't know how to join that together. That doesn't mean they're incompetent. That just means it's really hard to do that. But digitization enables that to be more possible now. And the opportunity for cities to understand society is really big and the need is massive. Because back to the business, demand needs to be driven by what people want and need. And the only organizations that can really understand that in a for public good sense is the public organizations. Unfortunately, the organizations that do understand society better are things like the supermarkets. And they use that to make more money. So how can the small and medium cities in particular understand how to build the capabilities, skills, how to get the funds through platforms to actually understand who's out there and what they want. It's really, really important. So the example of, uh, of Giuseppe in, in, in Italy is a really good example of where you're actually getting groups of communities to, to, to demand aggregate and actually understand what do people want? What, what questions are they asking in terms of a little bubble diagram and how can I serve them better? And so it's a huge opportunity. So a challenge, yes, I place it there. There's a huge, huge opportunity for cities to be a lot smarter. And if they are, they'll deliver twice as good in half the time for half as much in terms of solutions. Did that address your question? Thank you. Thank you, Graham. OK, well, uh, we run out of time. Thank you very much to all the speakers. Uh, to, to end this, I just want to say that uh, they have just shared with us five different uh, stories in different regions all over the world. So we have to look for local solutions, but global strategies, because the users' needs in general are the same, are similar. And nothing, nothing more. Thank you very much for the assistance, and we'll see you. Thank you.